I first want to uh, thank everyone for taking that extra second to look at the other George Yancey and realize that he spells Yancey without a C. I mean, it's without an E. Therefore, we are different George Yanceys, which is kind of funny. It's a funny story in a sense because he also studies racial issues, which the first part of my career, I did a lot with racial issues. So, so this is not the first time that we've been mixed up together. And we've actually met and kind of laughed about it. Uh, surviving and thriving in Christianophobia. One of the reasons why I, uh, you know, I didn't know much about Rachel Christie. In fact, I still don't know how to say the first name. Uh, <clears throat> until I began to look more and more into what you all did, and I loved it because apologetics has played an important role in my life, personally. I became a Christian uh, as an undergrad, sailed along as a Christian, went to graduate school, and contrary to what you might think, for a while, you know, I was doing quite well in graduate school. It wasn't I went to graduate school, all these people pounded on me. I said, oh, no, no, I can't be a Christian any longer. However, personal things in my life begin to make me question, do I really want to stay a Christian? You see, God disappointed me. And what disappointed me as much as God was my Christian friends disappointed me. And I came to the point where emotionally, I didn't want to be a Christian. And I had all these other friends around me who were not Christians who seemed to be having a good time. I was like, I want to have a good time too. And emotionally, I didn't want to be a Christian, but I had a problem. Before I went to graduate school, I spent a lot of time reading Josh McDowell and Paul Little and all these apologetics, and, and it made so much sense. And I listened to my professors, and whenever they got into the subjects of sociology or stats or methods or or Weber, they, they made sense. When they got to talking about religion, they didn't make much sense. And so I knew that for me to leave my faith, I would have to go against what intellectually I knew was not true. Emotionally, I was there. I was like, yes, let's party. Intellectually, I couldn't go there. So for a while, I was quasi-depressed. It's like, I want to, but I can't. I want to, but I can't. And for me, what eventually had to happen was I had to become hard-minded and go where the evidence went. And that led me reluctantly back to, to my savior and eventually to grow and to overcome those, that situation. Tonight, I'm gonna ask you to be hard-minded, to go where the evidence takes you. Things have changed in our society. And if we go back to the way the society was, the way we thought it was, we're gonna make mistakes. The first part of my talk, I'm gonna show some of this data. I'm gonna show some of this evidence to how things have changed. In the second part, I will talk about where we're, the, the hope, how we're gonna endure, how we're gonna move forward. Look, I have no doubt that we're gonna survive as a people. I mean, come on, we survived the Romans, we survived all sorts of attempts to wipe out Christians. What we're facing now is not harsher than what other Christians have gone through. But we have to know that things have changed and be prepared for what lies ahead. So some of what I might say, you know, you might have to have a hard mind about it as we move forward. So let's go into some of, the, some of that evidence. Christianophobia. To understand Christianophobia, we first have to see who tends to have animosity towards Christians, right? Who are these people? So to do this, I, and I'm going to, not, I'm going to not try to spend as much time on the methodologies and such, and they're, they're in my books, uh, and we can talk about that at a later time, that's fine. I'm going to go through them kind of fast, because I want to get to the findings a lot easier. But basically, what I did was I took a national sample that had, a, had what they call thermometer studies. I mean, I'm sorry, thermometer questions. So zero means absolute hate, 100 means absolute love. So Texas Longhorns, for me, 100. <laughs> Aggies, negative 10. <laughs> okay, if you have all these thermometers, what happens when you rank a group a standard deviation below the average. I would argue that 
that shows that you have a disaffinity towards that group. If you rank that group in 80 and everyone else in 90, that says something, right? So who has disaffinity towards certain groups? All right, go ahead, yes. I apologize, this may not be as, and I'll read some of this. Uh, this is the chart of the disaffinities. The group that faces the most disaffinities are atheists. About 45% of the respondents ranked atheists, a standard deviation below all other groups. We'll go into that in a little bit. The second group, no, 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 go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, 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 back. Okay. The second group are the fundamentalists. Now, the way they asked it was Christian fundamentalists. So before anyone says, well, fundamentalists can mean uh, a lot of different groups, they asked about Christian fundamentalists. How do you define Christian fundamentalists? I think Westboro Baptists. Uh, but a lot of people, and I know this from other research I've done, when they think fundamentalists, you know what they think? Those people who believe the word of God, that, that the Bible is the word of God, they're fundamentalists. Those people who claim to be born again, they're fundamentalists. So there's, you know, there's some give and take on what is a fundamentalist. What you need to know is about 30% of the people rank Christian fundamentalists a standard deviation below all the others. Uh, Muslims is the next group. They're slightly below Christian fundamentalists, but not by much. For our practical purposes, we can say the same percentage of people who don't like Christian fundamentalists don't like Muslims, but the people who don't like them are quite different. You're gonna see that in a little bit. So about 30% each on the groups. You all have heard about Islamophobia in the media, right? Heard about Christian phobia very much? Same percentage of people don't like, uh, sort of Christians don't like Muslims. Haven't heard about it, have you? Uh, Mormons is down lower. And then these last four groups were racial groups. I thought that's kind of interesting because, and I've studied race, I'm still considered a race scholar, even though I don't do research in that any longer. So I still understand race is a part of the, our struggle in our society. But when it comes to these sort of disaffinities, you can see that race really doesn't score up very, you know, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, does not score up very highly, all right? And I do believe that our conflict has moved more towards a racial realm towards a, in a religious realm in our society. So let's understand who that 30% is. All right, now. Okay, go ahead. All right, to understand this chart, the gold here is the total. So that is your, your standard. This is percent male. The blue is the, per the percent that's anti-fundamentalist. The red, anti-atheist. The green, anti-Muslim. From what you can see here is that the anti-fundamentalists are more likely to be male than the gold bar. So too, the uh, anti-Muslim. Those who are anti-atheists are more likely to be female. Okay, let's go to the next one. Yes, go ahead. This is percent white. As you can see, the blue bar compared to the gold bar, uh, those who are anti-fundamentalists are more likely to be white. And so are those who are, who are anti-Muslim, those who are anti-atheists are less likely to be white. So you see our problem right now. The people who hate Christians and Muslims are white guys. We just gotta deal with the white guys. <laughs> All right, go to the next one. All right, look at this one, education. This percent with a bachelor's degree. You see the gold bar, about 30%. Anti-fundamentalists, about half of them have a bachelor's degree. And there's not much difference between those who are anti-atheist and anti-Muslim when it comes to education. Go to the next one. This is a people who make over $100,000 a year, which is no one in this room, I, I'm, I'm guessing, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, the gold is the uh, standard. Look at the anti-fundamentalists. 28% of them make over $100,000 a year compared to about 18% of the rest of the population. And then look in the middle. So if you want to look at the, those who are anti-Muslim, they're white guys, but they're not as well educated and they're not wealthy. The ones who are anti-fundamentalists are white guys with money and well educated. Those of you who have had a sociology class know this. Us sociologists, we focus in on what? Race, class, gender. And we talk about how white men, rich white men 
are the, the ones with privilege, right? Well, the rich white men are the ones who hate Christians. Now, that is, you know, obviously you need more information than that. But when you think about it, the people who have, who have animosity towards Christians are white males, highly educated, and wealthy. They have more per capita power in our society than anyone else. It is true that those who are anti-atheists outnumber them. But if you're paying attention here, those who are anti-atheists tend to be non-white females, not much education, not much money. So there's more of them, but they have less power, per capita power. Now let's get a little bit more information about who has anti-fundamentalists. Go to the next one, religiosity. This is the percentage that never attended church, all right? You see the gold bar and then the blue bar, anti-fundamentalist, is higher. It means those are anti-fundamentalists are less likely, and it's not just church, it's any religious institution, uh, compared to the anti-atheist and anti-Muslim are less likely to have attended in the past year. And then go to the next one. This is political affiliation. This is percent liberal. Uh, the gold bar is about 30%. Anti-fundamentalist is about 47, 48%. So now we, can, we have two more characteristics of those who are anti-fundamentalists. They are less religious and they're more progressive. Okay, Let me, let's summarize all this up. Let's go to the next one. All right, this gives us all the numbers we need right here. This first group, which is about 32% of the population, are Christians who, who say the Bible's the word of God. So not just Christians anywhere, Christians who say the Bible's the word of God. The other group are the ones with anti-Christian hostility, all right? The ones with standard deviation below. So you can look at it. You know, the male of, among those who uh, Christians believe the Lord of God is 44%. The other one, 52%, more male. White, 50% is our Christians. Anti-Christian hostility, 71%. Whenever people tell you that in America, Christianity is a white man's religion, that means they, they've not done like their stats lately. <laughs> bachelor's degree, 20% of the Christians have a bachelor's degree compared to 49%. Uh, more than 100K, 9.7% of Christians, 27.8%, almost three times as much as likely. Politically liberal, 16.6% compared to 46.7% attend church weekly, 39.5%, actually I'm embarrassed it's that low, uh, compared to 12.4%. So that summarizes all of it up. Let's think about this for a second. What does this mean? Where do we find individuals who, are, who tend to be white, tend to be male, educated, income, tend to not have a high degree of religiosity and also tend to be politically progressive. You will find those people in the cultural institutions of our society. You will find them in education. You will find them in the media. You will find them in the arts. You will find them in the entertainment industry. These are the individuals you are more likely to find in our cultural institutions. What this means is that our culture, and you're gonna find this out the rest of this evening, I am big on how powerful our culture is and how our culture influences how much people think. And who is influencing how much people think? These are individuals who have, a, have some degree of hostility towards Christians. Okay, this quantitative analysis is like looking at it from an airplane 15,000 feet up. You can see the patterns, but you don't know what's motivating the patterns. To look at it on the ground, you need what we call qualitative work. And I conducted some online interviews with open-ended questions with a group that met this, this criteria, cultural progressive activists, uh, organizations that, that drew them in. They were, I won't show the data, but they were overwhelmingly white, male, wealthy, educated, irreligious, uh, and progressive. So from that, I got qualitative quotes 
I want to use this to show how these individuals think. Now, there's not an exact match. I, I get that. I mean, there, there needs, there's more work that needs to be done. But this will give us a sense on how they approach things so that we know what the challenge is going to be and what we need to do. All right? I'm not able in this time to go into all the nuances. So I've selected certain themes that I want to focus in on. First, let me just go ahead and uh, illustrate that there is a lot of hostility. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I had to read this, OK? I did that for you. I read those quotes again and again and again. And there was a lot of them, too. So you should appreciate what I had to do. In fact, if, don't go any further. Uh, the name of the book, So Many Christians, So Few Lions, the reason why I named it that, that was multiple times people talked about either So Many Christians, So Few Lions, or, you know, too bad we, don't have, we can't bring back the lions. Uh, about six or seven times people said that in the quotes, in addition to the quotes I'm about to show you. And in fact, when I, when I titled that, one person said, I saw a bumper sticker that said that, and I kind of like that. Uh, and so I got online. And you know, you can buy a So Many Christians, So Few Lines bumper sticker, T-shirt, cap. And you know, you can buy a baby onesie, So Many Christians, So Few Lines, too, <laughs> just, just so you know. Yeah. Now, I am not a fan of the Confederate flag. Try to buy a Confederate flag online. You won't be able to. I mean, you, if, I guess if you know the secret website where it's at, but you can't do a search for it. You can buy a shirt that says, so many Christians, so few lions, joking about, I don't know, torching Christians to death, but you can't buy a Confederate flag. And this is the hostility. I want them all to die in the fire. Not just die, burn, please. Churches, oh, well, y'all can read this. Churches and House of Richmond should be considered a nuclear test zone. Kill them all, let, let their God sort them out. We'd like to give them all a frontal lobotomy. Not a few of us, all of us, a frontal lobotomy. Line them up and shoot them. Kind of like they did in Nazi Germany, the Jews, right? The only good Christian is a dead Christian. Now that one, you know, that one caught my attention because I study race. I, I actually know the actual quote is all, you know, the only good Indians I know are dead. And, and that was by, I think, uh, General Sherman. Uh, no, it's Sherrod, I'm sorry. Uh, anyways, that was, hey, the Indians are just a pesky thing that we gotta get out of the way. And this is the attitude that we see among some of the individuals who have this Christian phobia. Now, let me be clear. Not all my respondents had this sort of attitude, all right? So don't go out saying, oh, you know, 30% of the country wants a shot. That is not true. I don't know what percentage has this sort of animosity, because I can't do the research. It would be quite costly to do that sort of research. But, and I use this in, in my book, what if I did a study of a large church, and I found several quotes where people were saying, so many Jews, so few ovens. Would we not say that church was anti-Semitic? So the fact that you can sell bumper stickers the fact that you can sell baby onesies shows that this is not a isolated opinion. The hostility is very real. So that's the first point I wanted to make. And in my book, I, I have about a, a page and a half of quotes like this. So if you really want to be depressed, you don't have to buy my book. Just go and look. I'll show you the page, and then you can read it, and then you can go and cry, OK? <laughs> but here's, now, let's dig a little bit deeper into why they have these feelings, whether, you know, whether they're right or wrong, and trust me, I believe they're wrong, we need to understand why, what motivates them. First thing, they think Christians want to set up a theocracy. This came up again and again and again in their comments, that Christians are, are trying to take away our rights, and they're going to force us into their churches, and then they're going to make us uh, live the way that they want to. They want to go to a theocracy. I believe 
and this person is talking about Christians. I believe they seek to impose a theocracy in, on a secular nation, sort of like a Christian Taliban. So all the things we read about, the Taliban and all the things, some people, and th th believe me, this was not the only person who talked about the Christians being a Taliban or Nazi Germany or, or anything of this nature, uh, that these things are attributed to Christians. So, and as I know it sounds ridiculous, but I think these people actually believe, some of them actually believe that Christians want to set up a theocracy like that. Their agenda seems to include making America a theocracy, which frightens me, as it would take us back to the dark ages, politically, culturally, educationally, and morally. So we're going back to the guillotines. We're going back to the dark ages. I, w I wish I could tell you, you know, these are t only two or three comments. When you do academic writing, it is not fair to take two or three comments and blow it up. There's actually some people who were talking about how you know Christians should not be able to serve in the army and stuff like that, but only one or two. So I didn't talk about that in the book, other than to point out there was a couple of nut jobs out there. This is a common theme, talking about theocracy, among many of my respondents. So there is this fear of a theocracy. So how do you deal with this fear of a theocracy? Well, one of the things is that these respondents feel a certain moral superiority because of their values. And one of the values that they talk about yeah, is religious neutrality, such as this respondent. I do not believe laws should be passed that affect any one religion over another. I do believe that existing laws should be enforced that could have a negative impact. <clears throat> My respondents would talk about how we should be neutral. Now often, especially since a lot of them are atheists, I think I have about 75% that are either atheists or agnostics. Uh, you know, religion neutrality may be getting rid of religion completely, that way we're all neutral. Of course, it reinforces their own values. Uh, but they really see themselves as enforcing religious neutrality. And it's important to understand that that's how they see themselves, whether we think that they are or not. Because then we understand where they're coming from and possibly how to deal with them. This one also, uh, Ask them questions, should we change laws to deal with the, the uh, Christian right? No, I'm a firm supporter of government neutrality towards religion. No law should be passed that singles out the Christian right or Christians in general or atheists or any other group whatsoever. So on top, you know, you have this hatred, but then you have this pressure to be religiously neutral. So how do you deal with this? As a scholar of race and ethnicity, and by the way, let me just say up front, Christian phobia is not the same as racism, okay? There are some key differences, I won't go into them. So I don't want anyone to walk away and say, oh, you know, he says that this is like racism, it's not. But there is some key concepts that can help us understand what's happening. And one of the key concepts is this concept called disparate impact. And the way this concept works, and I'll put it in racial terms, and then we'll, we'll see how it plays itself out uh, with, with the respondents. The way it works is that we know that there's a certain percentage of people who have racial animosity, but in modern society, they don't want to show it. So you have something like an immigration policy, a debate over immigration policy. Now, some people uh, oppose uh, changes to immigration policy because they have legitimate concerns, issues. But let's be realistic. Some people don't like Hispanics. That's reality, OK? And because they don't like Hispanics, they're going to oppose immigration policy as well. And the way you have to deal with it is looking at it is that immigration policy has a disparate impact on Hispanics. I'm not going to be pulled over and, and you know, hey, are you from Mexico? Uh, most of us in here are not going to have that happen. It's going to be more like the Hispanics. So by supporting a policy like immigration or opposing immigration policy, you actually can sort of uh, express your anti-Hispanic attitudes. Now, this is a very real issue in race. But I, it's also a real issue, and I think it really helps us understand what's happening with Christianophobia. In fact, some of our respondents even alluded to this. Yeah. I don't think we should pass laws that are directed towards any particular group of people. However, if a perfectly good law happens to negatively impact the practices or beliefs of the Christian right, but protects the freedoms of most Americans, then I would be in favor. So if we can, if this law is gonna, it's gonna protect everyone, and it happens to impact the uh, uh, Christians, well, then that's okay. So here's what I'm saying. 
the notion that some Christians have that people are going to come in and arrest Christians for being Christians in the United States, I don't see any evidence of that here in my sample. However, the notion that they would support rules or laws that have a disparate impact if you can find a justification that is not bigoted, that notion is very much alive. I'd be opposed to any laws that target groups, a group just because of membership. On the other hand, I think it's wise to target some of the behaviors that are the problems. So we're not going to target the group, but we're going to target your behaviors. Homeschooling, it's one thing to teach your kids your beliefs, but it's not okay to restrict their education. I'm very stronger rules in the content of homeschooling. Now, I don't know this person. You know, I always want to do research. I try not to know the people I'm doing the research because I want, uh, you know, t for a variety of reasons so that they can feel comfortable to say what they want, and I don't want to know either. But I'm guessing that this person rules will have a certain bias to them as to what we can and cannot teach. But hey, you know, but I'm not targeting that group. <clears throat> There's another concept that is quite important when we look at this as to what they want. And I think this is the concept that we really have to th consider. The respondents want Christians out of the public square. Oftentimes, and I read this multiple times, remember I read, read all the respondents multiple, multiple times, and I had to re keep rereading this, talked about how Christians can be Christians in their homes and in their churches, but you know, not in their businesses, uh, not in government, uh, perhaps not even in the schools that they set up, and there's, there's some issues coming up on that. And my respondents uh, really illustrate this. Uh, keep all religion in your church, in your home, out of the public square, and most importantly, out of my faith. <coughs> Christian right people can do what they want in their churches and homes, but not in the public arena. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, yes. Keep your religion at home, in your church. Why or oh why is that not enough? Now, my response to that, thank you. My response to that is, you know what? Yeah, let's do that for the feminists as well. Keep your feminism in your homes, in your feminist organizations, and out of the public square. Let's do that for the LGBT community. Keep it in your homes, keep it in your, in your organizations, and out of the public square. Let's do that for other groups as well. And so you can see that the pretense of religious neutrality is that they, there are special rules they have for Christians. You can be a Christian in your home and in your churches, and that's all. This gives us an idea of what these individuals want. Now, having present this, one of the responses is that, okay, you know, this is what people say, but you really don't have any evidence that they are treating Christians differently or worse than other groups. And this is why I was grateful, and, and maybe it was God who was doing it, that before then, years before I'd done this work, I'd done another work where I looked in academia and I looked at, and I will be honest, when I did this research, I expected to find, I expected to find some religious bias true, but I expected to find more political bias because I knew that there were groups that were Christian sociologists. I did not know any groups that were Republican sociologists. So I thought, well, there's gonna be more political bias. My, don't tell my wife, but I was wrong. You know, <laughs> let me show you what I did. Excuse me, but I really want you to see this, this question. And I'm going to read it to you because I, I want you to see how I construct this question because when I do research, I try to be as fair as possible. I'm not trying to do gotcha research. I've been accused of that by people who don't want the results, but the results are the results. You know, if you don't want research to show you're a bigot, don't be a bigot. <coughs> Assume that your faculty is hiring a new professor. Below is a list of possible characteristics of this new hire. Many of them are characteristics that you cannot directly inquire of a prospective candidate. However, if you're able to learn these characteristics about a candidate, uh, would that make you more or less likely to support their hire? Please rate your attitude on a scale in which one indicated the characteristic greatly damages your support to hire the candidate, 
Four is that that characteristic does not make a difference. And seven indicates the characteristic greatly enhances your support to hire the candidate. If you do not understand the characteristic, then please indicate with an NA. I gave them an out. Four. Okay? You know, if I'm working at University of Texas, atheist applies for a job, four. You know, I'm at a state university, I'm gonna evaluate that person based on their qualifications. If they're more qualified than the evangelical who's applying, I'm gonna support the candidacy of the atheist, four. Or, if you, could, you could just put N-A. If you're not sure, you could put N-A. So, really, anything other than a four means that you are taking into consideration qualities that do not pertain to the job. Because the qualities I asked about were about their political uh, affiliation, their religious identity, their sexuality, their family situ marital si status situation, uh, even their age. Uh, I even asked about hunter and vegetarian. You know, I just got a little crazy and said, hey, why not throw those, throw those in there? Really didn't make much of a difference, but it was fine. Okay. These are the disciplines that I looked at. So I did a variety of different disciplines, uh, mostly science, well, they're all science and humanities disciplines. Obviously, I can't do all the disciplines, uh, but these, this gave me a, a pretty wide spectrum. Now, I'm just going to aggregate all the results. Uh, and, and this is in my book, Compromise and Scholarship, and there I break it down. You can see that, that the discipline does matter. However, uh, while the discipline matters, while it's worse in some disciplines than it is in others, the patterns were the same. It's, it differed in degree, but it didn't differ in what actually the results were. So, let's go to the results. Okay, so we can see fundamentalists, uh, Republican, Muslim, evangelical, homosexual, atheist. The blue line is the fundamentalists. And this is aggregated. So about half of all my respondents for all these different disciplines are less likely to hire someone if they find out that they're a fundamentalist. Now, I didn't put Christian fundamentalists, so you could say, well, you know, fundamentalists. So evangelical. That's the red line. Almost 40% of the respondents say, now some of, it, some of them say slightly, but some of them say greatly, damages their willingness to hire someone if they find out that they're evangelical. Republican, you see it drops down about 25%. So this, that was my surprise. I thought the Republican would be higher than the, than the religious variables. Well, what about the homosexual, surely that's the problem, uh, about 5%. The Muslim, about 6% it looks like, and then the atheist around the same amount. Well, maybe some people, it enhances their willingness to hire them, and that's what this other side shows. And you can see that, you know, academics are a skeptical lot. It hardly ever enhances to find out something about someone, uh, except a little bit for the homosexual and the atheist. Uh, but the others are very, very low. Now, what this is, is a case of religious discrimination. Because if, you know, excluding religious campuses, and there was a few religious campuses, and if you'll take them out, the results are basically the same. If you take in consideration someone's political, religious uh, values in hiring them, uh, apart from anything else, then you are practicing discrimination. Now this is aggregate, and so you can't say in any one case you have evidence, but this shows that in academia that there is religious discrimination. Well, you know what? That's just one study. You know, it's a study by a Christian, so it can't be worth anything. Well, actually there's other evidence. Okay, the first evidence, Ibars and Lammers. Ibars and Lammers, now they're not looking at religious discrimination, they are looking at political discrimination. What they find is that, uh, and they did something similar to what I did, they did a, sent out a questionnaire, and people answered these questions, and people were saying, you know, yes, uh, someone who writes a paper, an article from a Republican point of view, I'm less likely to accept the article. If I find someone's a Republican, I'm less likely to hire them. If I find they're a Republican, I'm less likely to invite them to a, to a symposium. 
uh, and the fourth one was about getting a grant. Now, I use that to say the results from my previous study is not limited to being hired. We could probably assume, since they found this for Republicans, that they find you're an evangelical Christian, it be a hard time getting published. A little side here. I publish a lot in race, and then I did Christianophobia. I can tell you, even though I've published Christianophobia, it's harder, even though I'm more experienced in my craft nowadays. So I do know that there is a factor there, and I, there's other stories I could tell, and I won't for a sake of time. Uh, invite to a symposium, get a grant. You know, I'm not even going to try to get a grant from a traditional granting agency to study Christianophobia. Uh, it's just not worth my time, you know, because you know, the fix is in. Uh, so Ibars and Lammers is some evidence. Tobin and Weinberg, they actually are writing for a Jewish institute. They're both Jews. And they actually did a survey because they thought anti-Semitism was a problem in academia. And then when they asked uh, people to rate different groups, they come back shocked that 53% of the professors don't like evangelical Christians. And that Jews, you know, that was way low. So if you're saying, I found this because I'm a Christian, all right, take a look at their work. Now, Rothman and Lichner is very interesting. What they found is that when you look at where academics get their jobs, there are certain statuses. You know, there's the Harvard, Yale's, University of Chicago's, and then, you know, you, you have uh, more middle schools, you know, probably Texas, but maybe uh, University of New Mexico and things of this nature. And then you have uh, four-year schools, University of Wisconsin Whitewater and things like this. And then you have your community colleges. And then way at the bottom, you have Texas A&M. <laughs> no, 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 not yet. I'm not done yet. That, that, that was my joke. Uh, Rothman and Lichner saw where people got jobs. And then they did a survey. And they were able to look at demographic variables. They were able to look at how productive they were. And then they were able to look at their attitudes. And what they found out was that their basic political attitude, whether they were conservative or liberal, didn't, did not matter. However, if they were a cultural conservative, Concerned on issues of abortion, homosexuality, then they tend to be placed in lower status academic jobs, even after you control for their academic achievement. So this is not a case where, you know, those Christians are so busy protesting the clinics, they don't have time to write the articles. Even when you control for that, they're in lower status positions. And I say Christians, you know, to be fair, it could be other religious groups. My experience with academics, if an academic is a cultural conservative, they're religious. It's hard to find one who is not, uh, who's a cultural conservative and not religious. Okay, and then I, I did put the Mike Adams case, and I guess I should have you just come up and describe that all over, because you do have, you do such a much better job, but those of you who don't know, uh, it's a case of a professor who sued his university and the evidence came out that they discriminated against him, at least in part, because of his Christian beliefs. And, as he, and that's why they denied him going up for full professor. Now, I use that case because sometimes people say, we well, don't have any cases where it actually happens. I actually know of other cases, but the person who told me, told me in confidence because they came to an agreement. But I can talk about the Mike Adams case because it went to court, and the findings was that they did discriminate against. So, do not fool yourself into thinking that this is the only time that this happens. I can tell you that I have uh, <clears throat> been with uh, professors, and I'm not, you know, I have good relations with, with my professors, uh, my colleagues, but every now and then someone will say something, you know, a student's applying for a slot in our graduate program, and he or she comes from a Christian college, and someone says, well, you know, is that a good college? And I have to say, look, you cannot do that. Can I assume because the college is a Christian college, because I know that's what they're doing, that it's a lower standard in their school. We need to evaluate this person based on their own qualifications. So you don't have to go to the extent of what happened with Mike Adams for this to be a problem. So we have this animosity. We have these individuals with cultural power and who will use this power to keep Christians uh, out of academia, 
not completely. This is not Jim Crow, but to put up higher barriers, this is reality. If you wonder why it's not been studied before now, Christianophobia, well, if you have, you know, academics is where we're supposed to study inequalities, but the academics themselves are biased, how are you gonna study that inequality? The academics themselves are anti-Christian, how are you gonna study anti-Christian attitudes? So if you wonder why there's, res there's not research on Christianophobia in other dimensions, think about who studies them. Just a little aside here, I'm actually working on a book that looks at the media. And uh, I'm hoping to finish the prospectus next week and send it off. And if things really go fast, maybe this time next year, I'll have flyers for the book that I can pass out and, and hawk that. Uh, and I won't go into the results, although if you, if you talk to me not nicely afterwards, I might let something go. But uh, the results are kind of what you might think they might be. And it's not just about Christians, what I look at, but I'll just let go at that. But no one has looked at it that extensively simply because the academics are supposed to be the referees of who gets pushed around in our society, the referees the fix is in. These are the Oklahoma State referees. If you saw the Oklahoma State Texas game, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that Christians are being uh, tr mistreated like uh, blacks in the, in the Jim Crow South. That this is not, you know, always. And, and Christians sometimes do blow it up, and and you know, and I'm very careful about that. But it is clear that there is an anti-Christian bias by people who are quite powerful and they control our cultural institutions and that control the cultural institutions really helps to control the mindset of our society. We truly now live, in, as of today, in a post-cultural Christian society. Okay. Oh, wait. I think you skipped it. Yes, yes, there you go, okay. So where do we go from here? This is where we have to be hard-minded. This culture has changed. Now, God can do anything, and God may decide to instantly change it back. And if God decides to do that, praise God. But we can't count on that happening. And as a sociologist, I'm going to tell you that it, you know, it took decades for us to get here. And unless God decides to do something miraculous, it'll take decades to change it. All right? What I'm gonna say, some of y'all may not like. But I'm gonna say it anyways, because I say stuff people don't like, and that's the way it is. But we have a presidential election coming up, and if you think electing Ted Cruz is gonna solve this, you're woefully mistaken. And I'll tell you why. The culture, let's say you, let's say you get the president candidate you want. And you, and you keep the Senate, and you keep the House of Representatives, and you can, you can change these laws. If the culture is in the hands of the people with Christianophobia, how long do you think those changes are going to last? The culture is going to dictate a lot of how people think. And this, you know, and I'm going to talk about how we need, what we need to do in order to change this, but let's be realistic. These changes are not instantly going away. There's been a lot of talk on same-sex marriage. I don't want to talk about whether same-sex marriage is good or not. I want to talk about what created same-sex marriage. Because if, if, if you focus in on, let's overturn that decision, and somehow you get it overturned. You know, I'm not a lawyer. Maybe, maybe, maybe it can be overturned really soon. But we, freak, we don't see why it came in the first place. I think I'll get it back again. So let me, let me talk a little bit, not from a lawyer or an activist one point of view, but from a sociologist point of view, why I think the same-sex marriage decision happened. Okay. All right. It used to be, go ahead and go to the first one. It used to be that we had a purpose for the family, purpose for marriage. And the basic purpose, not the only purpose, but the basic purpose for the family, and not just in our culture, but in just about every, every culture you can think of, was to have kids and to raise them. 
Now, this is not to say that there weren't families that did not have kids. And there were families that had kids, and we did not want them raising kids. <laughs> okay? So, obviously, it's not 100%. But that was the basic purpose of the family. Why was it? Because it served a purpose in a community. And in a Christian culture, and by the way, a Christian culture did not mean that everyone was Christian. But a Christian culture meant that there was cultural values that put pressure on people. So if a man decided, you know, I'm tired of this woman uh, and the kids, and I just want out, a lot of times in the past, he wouldn't go out. Maybe he'd do other things, crazy things, but he would stay there and support her because of cultural pressures. Pressures that are not there any longer, okay? So this Christian culture not just impacted Christians, but everyone in there. And part of it was that the purpose of marriage and family was to have kids and to raise them, all right? If the purpose is to have kids and to raise them, where do same-sex couples come in? Clearly, same-sex couples cannot have kids. You have to bring a third person in there in order to have kids. Two men cannot have kids unless a woman comes in there. Two women cannot have a kid unless a man comes in there, all right? What about raising kids? Haven't you heard all this, you know, the research shows that raising kids in same-sex couples is no worse than raising kids in upset sex couples. And, you know, that's what the research shows until someone named Mark Regnerus came by and did a study. And I know Mark Regnerus. Mark Regnerus is not a cultural warrior. In fact, he's done research that shows that absence education is not as effective as people think that it is. So this is not a guy that was like, woohoo, let's go to war. But he just wanted to look, he had an interesting question, he looked and said, so, oh, the rich, the, my study actually shows that there are dysfunctions that might be happening in same-sex parenting. And then, of course, the world fell, fell on him. Uh, he, his research was audited. Uh, there was threats to try to get him fired, threats to try to take the article out of the peer-reviewed journal. Uh, all this happened, and it got me interested. So I actually read the research that he was critiquing. And you know what? There is a very technical term for the research that came before Regnerus that showed the same sex parenting did not have an effect. That technical term is crap. <laughs> inappropriate, re uh, inappropriate reference groups, poor criteria, convenient sampling, which is fine if you want to do exploratory study, but not to make generalizable conclusions, you know, and it's not just my opinion. I can point you to the articles of people critiquing that research who came to the same conclusion. They, did, they, they just were more polite than me and they didn't say crap, okay? So, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but after Regnerus came out, a uh, researcher by the name of Allen also came to the same conclusions using a probability sample, and a researcher by the name of Sullins also came to that conclusion. Now, as a sociologist, I'm going to say that we don't know the effects of same-sex parenting. So I'm not going to say, all right, see, that shows it. I'm not going to make the same mistake that the others did, rush into a conclusion. That's why I say as a sociologist. My gut feeling tells me that if we did honest research, and I'm not sure that we can, but if we did honest research, we're going to find that same-sex parents don't do as good of a job as opposite-sex parents. That's my gut feeling. So same-sex couples can't have kids, and I think there's a reason to think that they don't raise kids as well as opposite-sex parents. So marriage for opposite-sex individuals. But see, things have changed. And to be honest, some of the change is our fault. And I'll even blame myself, because you know, I tend to have had this attitude earlier in my life, uh, thinking that marriage isn't necessarily for raising kids, but it's for personal fulfillment. We get married, not to raise kids, but, you know, personal fulfillment. This person fulfills me. They self-actualize me. If that is the purpose of marriage, then all honesty, why not same-sex marriage? If a person finds fulfillment with their own sex, why not? That's what the culture has said. That's what has made marriage. The culture has changed, and thus marriage has changed. You see, our culture was, was a Christian culture, was a communal culture where there was purpose, there was roles, and now 
is come to more individualistic culture. And that individualistic culture is what supports same-sex marriage today. And this is why I say that unless the culture changes, uh, you can have temporary victories, you can have tactical victories, but strategically you're going to lose. The culture determines a lot of what has happened. So we have to understand this, that, that this is not the way it was. Can you imagine the Supreme Court supporting same-sex marriage 20 years ago? Even if they'd done that, there would have been a constitutional amendment because the culture was not ready for that. We have to think about that. And to think about that, we have to think about what we really are. We have to forget what we once may have been. And it's scary and it's exciting all at once. And you know what we really are? Go ahead. We are the counterculture. We are now the counterculture. We are no longer the dominant culture. And you know what that makes? The elite sexualists, they are the man. <laughs> now, they're not going to want to say that they are the man because they've gotten a lot of mileage out of not being the man, out of, out of being you know, victimized. And I'm not saying that we should go around and say, oh, we're victimized, although we should point out when, when there are problems and we're being treated unfairly. Okay, um, but I'm not saying we should go around and say we're victimized, but we have to realize that we are now the counterculture. We're the ones who are trying to overturn the old cultural order because right now they are the old culture. They are the man, we are the counterculture, and we need to act accordingly. And that means, you know, we know that we are going to be rejected and laughed at, and that we're going to, have to overcome that. But if we're convinced that what we're doing is right, we got to keep fighting, and we are going to have to be persistent in our fight. Let's be honest. They control the cultural institutions. They control them. We don't. I remember there was a movie that came out a, a, a little while ago, and I, I didn't see the movie, uh, because when I saw the reviews, I thought it looked like a stupid movie. Uh, and it was called The Kingsman. Did anyone see that movie? Did you ask for your money back? Uh, I was told there's a scene in The Kingsman where basically the hero of the movie uh, somehow is brainwashed, so he goes into this church. Of course, the people in the church are all racist and bigots and everything like that, and he basically kills them all. And the way the scene is played out is this is supposed to be a, somewhat of a, I don't know if humorous, but you know, it's okay that he killed them all. Can we imagine a scene like that in a Jewish temple or Islamic mosque or uh, LGBT community meeting? Of course we can't. Why? Because we don't have influence in the counterculture, so when it's time to make fun of a group, hey, sort of Christians, we can make fun of them and we can kill them off. In a movie, of course. Okay. <clears throat> they have a desire to drive Christians from the public square. They do. And so this is what we challenge we face. We're the counterculture. Uh, we are in the public square today, but there's a desire to drive us out. Uh, we're going to have to fight to stay in that public square, uh, but understand that we do not have the cultural tools that others have to protect ourselves. And so we're going to have to make changes. These changes are not going to happen overnight. Okay? If, if you leave here with anything, understand that unless Jesus returns soon, unless God does a miracle, we're in for a long, long haul. Culture is the key. Here's what I mean by culture. I've already mentioned this. Yeah. <laughs> Arts, entertainment, academia, media, these are cultural elements that are very important that we have to look at. Right now, Christians do not have, have enough control, substantial control over any of these. Uh, enough control to really protect ourselves fully from our cultural onslaught. Now, I love apologetics, I love what you all are doing, but I think there is a blind spot because part of what we sometimes think is, well, if we can show people logically or rationality about uh, what's happening you know, with, with, with the Bible and, and with 
God and everything, that you know, they'll, they'll work their way to it. That's not always the case because culture is often more powerful than logic. People will do things because the culture tells them to do things, even when it's illogical. We know the big push today is in transgender, and people are saying, you know, hey, a person who is, I don't want to get deep into this issue, but a person who is biologically a male uh, can dress up as a, as a woman and go into a locker uh, full of other women, and that should be okay. And I remember reading an article somewhere, I forget where, I think it was overseas, where they discovered that guys were doing this and they were actually taking pictures of women. Imagine, guys actually want to see women naked. And they'll actually, you know, put on women's clothes. Or, I mean, I know this is shocking, but it actually does occur. <laughs> and so now they're trying to th rethink this. And, and, you know, you can argue, well, people are truly transgender, don't do this. But then you, you open the doors, what could happen, you know? Men who, uh, maybe they're not transgender, but they want to see naked women, you know? So you can see how culture oftentimes, and not just, you know, I'm not just talking about progressives. I mean, a lot of times culture, people do things that are not illogical because the culture enforces it. This is why it's so important that the culture is not in the hands of Christians and the culture can create outcomes beyond what we uh, think that it should. Now, here's one of the problems that Christians have done. Christians have abandoned the mainstream culture. And here's what I mean by this. At some point, I know this is more about education than others, but at some point in education, Christians begin to set up Christian schools, and, and that's great, but then they stop being in mainstream schools. And by being in mainstream schools, I mean as professors, as administrators. Uh, they would send their kids to those schools, but they would not go to those schools. Uh, the mainstream culture, we have Christian arts, Christian media, Christian entertainment, Christian schools, and that's great. In academia, if you go to a, a good number of schools, you will find Jewish studies programs. You will find Islamic studies programs. You know what you will not find? Christian studies programs. One of the things I'm wanting to do, personally, is to set up a Christian studies program at the University of North Texas. Now, it's a long road because, to be honest, I am, my skills is not as an administrator uh, or a fundraiser or any of that sort of stuff, uh, but I want to do research that supports Christians on a secular campus. Uh, I'm doing a newsletter. If you want to sign up, newsletter at my table, uh, you can find out more of my misadventures. That's fine as well. Uh, but I feel it's important for Christians, for some Christians, to not abandon the mainstream culture. So we need Christians in the arts. Uh, if you have a brother, Christian brother or sister who wants to go in the arts, do not discourage them. We need them there. Uh, we need good, good quality uh, media, good quality Christian arts, good quality Christian entertainment. Uh, you know, we don't need stuff. We don't, when I do Christian research, when I do research on Christians, my research has to be top notch, especially because of the research that I do. And so when we go into these other areas, we got to do top notch work. You know, working within the mainstream culture can be a calling. And some of you may be called to that. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you know you're called to be a pastor or a business person, that's great. Uh, a minister, that's great. If you're not sure, you might want to consider that. And if you want to study sociology, Denton is not a bad place to be. You know, close to Dallas, Fort Worth, and you get to watch the Longhorns every week. <laughs> now, I want to really reinforce just how powerful culture is and how it has changed our society. Uh, and I want to do this with a, with a visual illustration. So, all right, how culture has changed. Don't, don't do anything yet. When, and this is going to date me a little bit, but in the 1980s, uh, not the early 80s, okay, but in the 1980s, when I was in graduate school, I heard uh, about this person. And this person, my colleagues, uh, in grad school hated this person. The reason why they hated this person was that, you know, he was saying these things that they, they just could not abide by. And worse, people were actually listening to him and they liked what they had to say and they thought he was right. 
And they, were, they, were, they should have been concerned about this person because he was influential. This person was Rush Limbaugh. Most of y'all may not be old enough to remember when Rush Limbaugh really had a lot of power in our culture. And, you know, they had that phrase, ditto heads, which, you know, hey, you know, Rush is saying what I agree with. He was incredibly influential. And my friends were correct in saying that he was impacting our culture. And you could see that the culture at that time was one that was a little bit more communitarian, had more traditional values. I am not supporting Rush Limbaugh and some of the things that he said and some of the things he's, he's done in his life, but I recognize the power he had in our culture. Till recently, we had another person in our culture who has had a great deal of impact. Will people listen to this person? They don't really you know, weigh what he says. A lot of times he says something and people believe because he said it, it's true, like they did with Rush Limbaugh. This person, John Stewart, I read where some people listen, watch, the, watch The Daily Show and that was their news show. They got their news from Jon Stewart. Now he can say all these, well I'm not a news reporter, but he was uh, influencing the culture magnificently if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and people would, Stewart said it, he, look, look how he ridiculed it, and therefore it must be true. He's retired, so you know I guess he's off wrestling or something like that now, so I don't think it's going to be that in impactful. There'll be someone else. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the next person up there is a Christian? Uh, what if we could get someone, a Christian, who could impact the culture like these individuals could? The culture gets people to believe things, to accept things, often without even thinking about them. Now, I'm gonna bring up another concept, and I know when I first bring it up, some of y'all are going to bristle at it, but, but hear me out on this. Because I think, you know, as we think about where we're gonna go as a Christian community, we, we need to look at, uh, at these possibilities. So, go ahead. Some of you may have heard this concept called the, uh, the Benedict Option. Now, the Benedict Option is, okay, uh, this is not a Christian culture, so we need to build our own Christian culture and not worry about as much about taking over the rest of the culture. I'm gonna say there's something to that. Not that we're going to a monastery, all right? So I'm not talking about, hey, we're gonna go, we're gonna pull in all our teeth and we're just going to huddle up. But we can be a, a culture in our society surrounded by people who are not Christians because we have connections with the internet, we have connections in, in other ways. But I do think there's something about, part of what we have to do is look in ourselves and build our own culture. So, what is the Benedict option? I think that depends on what we make it out to be. I don't think that it is set in stone. Let me give some elements that I see that could be very useful if, as we rethink where we're gonna be at. First, I do think, even with the Benedict option, even with the idea of let's country our own culture, that we need defense. Uh, you know, we've heard people talk about how uh, we're, we're being driven from the public square, that we need to be defended. I do think that there is a need for defense. We need to be free to practice our culture the way we want to, regardless of what other groups want to do. We're not looking to force them to practice our culture, but we want to be free to practice our, our own culture. It's one of the reasons why things such as the all comers policy is so odious to me. You know, let Christian groups be Christian groups and pagan groups be pagan groups and feminist groups be feminist groups and, you know, we can have all kinds on college campuses. So, I see the big option as part is we need protection. But also, what if people see a Christian culture that witnesses by caring for one another? Now, there's, yes, this is not saying that we, we don't proclaim the word, all right? We do. But there's also something to showing a witness through our care. And I think in this new society, we have so many people who are, who are grasping at individualism. Seeing a caring community would be a powerful witness. I'll give you just one example. And, this, and we can think of other ways in which we can be that. I read an article that stated that if 
one out of every three churches in, our, in the United States adopted a kid out of foster care, we would no longer have a foster care system. We adopt all the kids out of foster care. What if we did something like that? What sort of witness would that be? Would that not be an important way of saying, look, you may not like us right now, we're not going away, and we're still going to care for the marginalized in our society. So how can we consider how can we care for others? How can we care for those in our communities, but those outside the community? Because I think that's going to win over a lot of people, and in a way that can help start changing the culture. I think there has to be an economic component to this in the early church. Uh, there was a desire to protect one another because they were economically marginalized. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to say Christians are marginalized uh, to the degree that we see other certain groups as marginalized, but there is economic pressure, and I think that we have to think about ways of protecting ourselves. And I'll give you one example. I'm not big into boycotts. What I'm big into is the boycotts. In other words, I don't want to think about boycotting Starbucks. I'd rather go to Chick-fil-A. You know, I don't want to boycott, you know, Walmart. Uh, I'd rather go to Hobby Lobby. But I don't know where to go. You know, I know some groups. I would love there to be a, some sort of guide in which, okay, these are Christian organizations, Christian businesses. We're going to ask you not to buy here, but why don't you buy here and support these individuals? So could there be an economic component to our Christian community where we feel more more connected to one another and we're supporting one another. So I hope you get the sense of a larger community uh, that we could be. And, and this is my interpretation of the Benedict Option. It's not a retreat, but strengthening our community so that we would be this vital witness. I think we need to infiltrate the old cultural order. So this is not a retreat. But once we're strengthened, then we can go into uh, academia and the media and the arts and be a presence there. And we're not going to take it over. We're just going to be a presence there. We're, we're, we're going to have contact with these individuals so that the next time they want to dehumanize or stereotype Christians, oh, I know someone who's a Christian. Ah, oh, I don't want to do that. And then I think this is something that we're going to struggle with, but in my opinion, our struggle is generational. If we're looking for the quick, easy fix, we're going to be disappointed. I don't know in my lifetime if we're going to see a return of a Christian culture. So I have to think about kids, 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 you know, keep fighting for that. And in that, we actually have an advantage, an advantage we don't often think about. So we have something to hope for when we think about something like that. In fact, let me show you. Oh, wait. Okay. Don't do it yet. Uh, another important answer to, uh, to what I see as part of the struggle that we are going to uh, deal with. This is part of the answer. My kid. Uh, I had to bring him somehow. He's only six months old, so. You know, one of the things is, and this is one of the things that Rachel Christie is doing very well, and I love the fact that you've decided that you're going to start ministry to high school students. In fact, in, in my school, not my school, in my uh, area, Dallas-Fort Worth, we've decided, my church, that we're gonna do an apologetics conference uh, because we want to, you know, we hope it goes beyond the students in our, in our church, uh, but we want the youth, I see as a college professor what happens when youth come to college and they're not prepared. We actually have a chance to make a big impact in our society if we can keep our youth. And we really need to struggle with this. Let me show you some data on this. Okay, this total fertility of women between 40 and 44, because most women between 40 and 44 are done having kids. Uh, I, I put this in red secular and blue traditional. Uh, so for the okay, unmarried to have sex, uh, red means yes and blue means no. Okay, and you can see the numbers down there, 1.5 and 2. Total fertility rate, uh, you really need to have, you have to have at least a 2, and you really probably 2.1 or 2.8, uh, I'm sorry, 2.1 or 2.08, uh, 
fertility rate to replace your cells, all right? So you can see that the traditional, people that are answering these questions traditionally are at two. They at least have a shot at replacing themselves. Those who are answering secular are at 1.5. They're not replacing themselves. Support same-sex marriage, the red means yes, the blue means no. They're not replacing themselves. Church between Christians and seculars, they're not replacing themselves. In part, your calling from tonight is to get married and have a lot of kids. <laughs> we'll have the same mission as possible if you accept this mission, but also to raise those kids. I take being a father very seriously. I'm already planning, you know, on, uh, on what I'm gonna do as far as talking to my kid about apologetics and at what age I can start. Six months is a little young. You know, I tried to explain Coslum to him, you know, the other evening, and he just, you know, he just babbled. Uh, but I take it very seriously. There's some people doing some interesting work. Uh, Natasha Crane, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's doing some really good stuff as far as apologizing for kids. Uh, we have to be good fathers, good mothers, uh, you know, make the time uh, to be with our kids. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on it. I only have a six-month-year-old. I'm not going to say, you know, I know all about it because, Sure enough, I have some things happening, and that's going to happen with this kid, and hopefully, you know, that we that we are going to have. But I do know that this is important, and we have to treat it as important. And as a Christian community, we really need to tackle the problem of how do we have our kids, and how do we keep them in the faith, and not just keep them in the faith, but also make them young evangelists. And that way, not only do we keep our 2.0 kids but they'll go out and get some more kids. If we can do this, we can actually shorten this, this, this cultural wilderness that we are currently in. So another uh, reason for hope is that we already have enough kids to change our culture. We just have to figure out how we're gonna raise them in ways in which they stay within the faith. Okay, let me just go ahead and close. Oh, are, are, do, do we need to close through now? Okay, I'm sorry. Am I, am I doing what, uh, what was happening last year and going over? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, tell you what, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to close at this point then. Uh, I think I've made the major points. Uh, I don't know if, there's, if we want to do questions and answers. We don't have to. So uh, I'll be out by my table. You want to do questions and answers? And thank you all for having me.